Good evening, Chair Costello, Mr. Slade, Brad, Council Member Ward. Hello, yeah. hello. I freaked out a minute ago, Nancy. I joined the meeting and my camera was on, but I wasn't. <laughs> oh, no. I haven't had that in a while. Yeah. So I dumped out and then came back. Came back, yeah. Gotta love technology. How is everyone this evening? Happy New Year. Hope your holidays were good. You too. They were nice and quiet. Whoops. Nice and quiet. Did you do some traveling over the holidays, Nancy? So about the week or two before we went to Vegas. Okay. My husband and I had never been there, so we went there and went to a concert and saw a few things. If you've never been to the neon sign grave graveyard, I would highly recommend. And even more so, if you have to choose, go to the Mob Museum. I was just going to mention that. Uh, yeah, Deb that was Debbie fantastic. and I honeymooned there about 10 years ago, but we didn't oh, get okay. to either one of those places. So oh. I really want to go back, but. There's the Mob Museum the is list. well worth it. Yeah, well worth it. Good evening, Linda. You're, echo you're echoing a bit. It's hard to hear you. Hello. Hi, Steven. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Nancy. I don't know how to respond. Hi, everyone. This is Zion calling in. I'm sorry? This is Zion. I'm calling in. Oh, thanks, Zion. I was just going to ask who was on the phone. Perfect. Thank you for that. I'm in uh, Mexico and I couldn't wouldn't let me uh, zoom in for some reason. Does not allow. That is dedication to call yes, in from that, Mexico. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Still waiting on Gary and uh, Mr. Dunning. Here's Logan. Hey, Logan. Evening, y'all. Gary. You're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute. Okay. Okay, Chair, you have everyone here. Would you like me to do roll call? Sure, that sounds great. Okay, Mr. Bowman. Gary, we're having, just so you know, we're having a little bit of a hard time. At least I am hearing you. Uh, Vice Chair Cohn? Here. Mr. Slade? Mr. Slade? Oh, you're on mute, I think. Or at least you're not coming through. Okay. I'm going to mark you as present, Mr. Dunning. I'm here, Nancy. Thank you. Mr. Spurgeon? 
Here. Council Member Ward. Here. Chair Costello. I am here. You have a quorum. All right. I am trying to open up the agenda. Here it goes. Okay. I just need to talk louder. Is there any, can we tell, is there anybody on here for uh, a public forum? There is, let me just double check. There is not. Okay, excellent. Well, we can. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Thank okay. you. Can you hear me now? <clears throat> and... I guess uh, new business is what we're on to next here. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time reading this document here. It's, it's not letting me open it up. Um, it looks like election of officers, chair and vice chair, and then we... That's Do I have a motion for? Uh, We've had was nominating Bernie for chair. Okay, thank you. Correct? I'm having. A you, did you just nominate Bernie for chair? Is that what we heard? Yes. Okay. A second. Okay. Any other uh, nominations or discussion? We need... Are we ready to vote, Chair? Sure. Okay, so it's been moved by Ms. Cohn, seconded by Mr. Slay to reelect Bernie Costello as chair. So that is the motion. Mr. Bowman? Yes. Vice Chair Cohn? Mr. Slade? Yes. Mr. Dunning? Yes. Mr. Spurgeon? Yes. Council Member Ward? Yes. Motion passed. Oh, excuse me, Chair Costello. Yes. <laughs> Motion passes. We're now on to Vice Chair. Chair. No second. Okay. I mean, I, just for everybody, I think that was to nominate Linda Cohn for vice chair. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. okay. Sorry, Gary. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Okay. And I'm sorry, Mr. Slade, you seconded or was that Mr. Dunning? Mr. Dunning, thank you. <clears throat> All right. Any other nominations or discussion or would you like to vote? Think we're okay to vote? Okay. Mr. Bowman? Mr. Slade? Yes. Mr. Dunning? Yes. Mr. Spurgeon? Yes. Council Member Ward? Yes. Vice Chair Cohn? And Chair Costello? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Are there anything else? In, I, sorry, there's an attachment here and I can't. I can uh, step in if you would like me to, Mr. Uh, Chair, because the next item is uh, the 2022 budget. And I do yeah, have, if, you, if you would, Brad, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, if, I have a very brief uh, introduction and summary on that. So as you know, um, we are responsible or the renewal authority is responsible for adopting an annual budget every year. And also, as you know, uh, the authority does not have any currently active projects. So this year's budget is essentially unchanged from last year's budget. So while we do have a fair amount that is budgeted and has been in recent years, um, I think the philosophy around that is to hold that money in reserve in case there are any types of projects or opportunities that may arise in the year. Um, don't have anything on the horizon that I could report this evening, but um, that gives the authority the ability to react quickly if needed to. 
and requested by the council. Um, gives us the gives you the opportunity to do that. But as far as some of the monetary expenditures on the larger side of things, um, auditing is still in there. Um, if anyone still wants to take advantage of technical training, uh, that is still in there as well. But I think some of that has slowed down, frankly, in COVID. I haven't seen a lot of opportunities yeah. um, for urban renewal training lately, but we'll keep our eye out for that. Uh, and then we have, a, we have an amount uh, dedicated for legal services in case there's any type of legal questions. Um, that come up during the year, and we would reach out to our to your special counsel, um, Paul Benedetti, on that. Uh, a couple of the other highlights in the budget that are listed is you can see that the loan uh, to Medici that is um, servicing the Broadway lofts is uh, still being serviced annually. Uh, annually. Uh, they're obviously. Oh, go ahead, Councilmember Ward. Sorry, just on the subject of legal. Um... There's been a little bit of a shift in philosophy in the city attorney's office recently in, in that the attorney's office is handling more matters in-house than what we used to. Have we considered, uh, rather than utilizing special counsel, going to the in-house counsel at the city attorney's office? Well, I can certainly talk to the city attorney about that. We haven't had any legal, legal uh, expenses in the last year or so. We had some, I believe, in 2020. We did not have any in 2021. Uh, and the, the Urban Renewal Council is somebody who has specialized in this type of law for over 40 years. So they have that specialized knowledge um, relative to the uh, intricacies of the state statute around urban renewal and those types of things. But I could certainly review that with the city attorney. Yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. At the very least, I'd like to ensure that the attorney stays looped in before we pay special counsel for something, just to make sure if it's a you know, chapter and verse item, we can get it done at a less expensive rate use utilize those resources more efficiently right i will uh, talk to her uh, about that so thank you for uh, for that suggestion uh so uh, the uh the loan to the the medici uh in the broadway loss project so i was saying uh that's still very much in service it's got about another 10 years of payments and you can see the balance there is a little under a million dollars now uh, relative to the outstanding loan amount and you can see that this year, the total payment from them to the, the authority will be just over $77,000 in principal and interest. And that is being uh, deposited into a special fund of the authority. So I know that some of you have been around for a while. You can uh, recall that I struggle with some of the accounting nomenclature uh, in terms of how our finance department does this budget. So you can see that uh, I think at the start of last budget cycle for the 2021 budget, we added those notes. If you're looking at your agenda, we added those notes around um, the expenses, the loan balance and the scheduled payments and cash on hand. So hopefully that gives you some direction in terms of having the confidence to adopt this year's budget. And as I said at the beginning of this conversation or presentation, uh, there are no changes uh, from last year's budget. So it's the same as 2021. And with that, I turn it back to you, uh, Chair uh, Costello, for any discussions and a possible motion. Well, if anybody has any questions, comments, or concerns, uh, please. Uh, Linda's raising her hand and then um, Will. Go ahead, Linda. I don't understand how this works very well. Why do we have less money at it? So if anybody heard that better than me, if it could be related, because I did not hear the question. I apologize. I think the question was, why do we have less money on the bottom line when we're spending the same this year? Did I state that correctly, Linda? I'm not seeing that there was anything diff different in the bottom line in terms of the budget. The budget is $210,000 and that's unchanged from 2021. Right, the end of year fund balance is lower. Yeah, when you, when you look at the end right. of the year fund balances, there, there's variation. And I'm guessing that is everything to do with the money received from the, from the loan. That I believe is correct. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with the administrative budget. It's related to the uh, the payments that are uh, relative to that loan servicing. The long term receivable lower. That's, well, yes, my question. That's uh, over time. 
My yeah, I think what's if, if, uh, is, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I think we're, we can finish with Linda. I mean, okay. Go ahead. So uh, my question is just kind of um, the other expense uh, category. You know, it's something that we've carried for a few years, um, and the the description down below just says that it represents placeholder for uh, a placeholder estimate. I'm just wondering, it's such a large amount. What what is that? What is that for? Well, as I think as we've discussed in the last the last couple of years, relative to, to not having any blight based project on the horizon. Um, that is strictly a reserve. So um, one of the things that would happen is if there were to be an urban renewal based project that um, somebody either approached the city about doing or the council directed the urban renewal authority to do, uh, then that amount of funding could be in place to essentially cover the amount to do that pre-planning and, and the development of an urban renewal plan. And I can tell you between the planning and the legal and everything else that would be required is it, even a fairly simple project would consume uh, a fair amount of that of that budget. So uh, the thing that you all have to remember, uh, and the reason why I don't think that there's anything on the horizon right now in terms of an urban renewal project, is because everything needs to be based on blight, and we don't have an area in the community right now that is struggling um, in terms of trying to attract new investment. In fact. I think Englewood is experiencing the opposite um, right now, especially as it relates to um, housing development throughout the community. That is, uh, with the exception of city center, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, well, I can't think of anywhere in the community that would require uh, that type of facilitation through urban renewal to attract new investment, at least at this point. Now, obviously con conditions can change, and that's why we wanna have that consistent amount in the budget year over year. So that if we do need, if you do need to react to an opportunity that you have the ability to do that. Awesome, thank you. Here, if you're okay, I'd like to check in with Mr. Spurgeon since he's on the phone. Did you have anything, any questions, Diane? I do not have any questions, no. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All righty, then should we move on to a resolution to adopt the general fund operating budget for the 2022 Englewood Urban Renewal Authority. I didn't catch that, Linda. Oh. I'm sorry. I think it's a motion to approve resolution one, Sears 2022. Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry, Linda, you're really just cutting up a lot. <laughs> And I'll, I'll that? second that. Thank you, Mr. Slade. Any discussion or do you want to move on to voting? I think we could vote. Yep. Okay. Mr. Bowman? Yes. Vice Chair Cohn? Yes. Mr. Slade? Yes. Mr. Dunning? Yes. Mr. Spurgeon? <clears throat> Council Member Ward? Yes. And Chair Costello? Yes. Motion passes, thank you. The next item on your agenda is the a proposal that we would like to make to do a bit of research uh, relative to some historic um, possible inaccuracies around property ownership between what is shared between City of Englewood and the Englewood Urban Renewal Authority. And I'll start off with a little bit of a story on this one, if you'll indulge me. Um, this last summer, out of the blue, I got an email from one of my fellow department heads saying that a citizen had called about um, a weed issue um, on the parking lot that is on the northeast corner of Broad South Broadway and Floyd, just north of the post office. There's about a 20 car parking lot just south of the Conoco station. And the reason why they contacted me is that because they said it's owned by the Englewood Urban Renewal Authority. And that was kind of news to me. I, I wasn't aware of that particular parcel being owned by um, the authority. So that got me to thinking about a couple things, which is one, in a minute, I'll talk about the, the new Englewood Downtown Development Authority, but it also got me thinking about something that had kind of been sitting in my files for a while. 
And that's the map that we attached to this agenda item uh, for discussion tonight. In 2009, there was an opportunity that the Urban Renewal Authority and the city cooperated on in transferring several properties uh, to the, from the Urban Renewal Authority to the city. And if you have access to that map, you can tell a lot of them are remnants and smaller undevelopable parcels uh, like the ones along Little Dry Creek. And there were some others uh, in the uh, just east of Broadway where the parking lot is now on the east side of Broadway. And there were others that at, at the time in 2009 were not transferred. So if you have access to the map, you see that kind of largest blob of yellow, which was their urban renewal owned properties um, west of Broadway. That's now largely the Broadway lofts um, development. So those are all um, privately owned now. But if you look at the very far northwest part of the site or the uh, map, uh, parcel number 18, I believe it is, that's still colored yellow. And that, in fact, is the one property that is still owned by the Urban Renewal Authority that we that I was definitely aware of. And that has a bit of a story in and of itself, and it relates to back to the old days in the 1980s project. When that shopping center was built, there was an environmental issue. Uh, I think it was an old gas station or something uh, on the very northwest corner of that site. And for whatever reason, at, the, at that point in time, they carved out that little parcel so that the acquirer of that land and the developer of the shopping center wouldn't be liable for it. So lucky URA, it's still owned by uh, the authority. However, Kimco, which now owns that shopping center, at whatever point in the future they would choose to, they have the right to purchase that for the grand total of $10. So it's not really a, a, a and it's also occupied by a, a use. So it's really not developable or anything that would be um, ready to change immediately. Council Member Ward, please. Sorry, just for reference, is that big box adjacent to that parcel? Is that the Hobby Lobby? Yes. Okay. And the parcel that this occupies is the preschool. Okay, great. Thank yes. you. Um, so anyway, that's the one that, that we definitely know that the Urban Renewal Authority owns. But then if you look at this map, that parcel that I was talking about in terms of the complaint that we got about weeds is number 16. And that's shaded as city. So I got to thinking about why don't we take a pretty comprehensive look and do a title search and title research on all of these properties to make sure that we all understand the city, the renewal authority, understand what this specific ownership is. And the reason why I'm suggesting doing this research is that we do now have a downtown development authority in place that covers almost all of these parcels. And if the URA owns any of these parcels that could, could be that could be combined with others in the future that would actually be able to be developed, the, the authority and the DDA may want to cooperate uh, on some on potential issues in the future relative to offering those for, for reinvestment and redevelopment at some point. So our proposal is to work with a title company. Uh, I can tell you the name of it, the first integrity title company. Nancy would be um, heading up this research. Uh, it's not a front burner item, so we probably get it, try to get it done maybe by the second quarter of this year uh, to get specific individual ownership confirmations for all of those properties that were listed in 2009 so that we can be sure. I'm just not sure that the, the Arapahoe County database is all that accurate um, based on what happened over the summer. So that's the reason why to do that and especially to see if there's any parcels that um, either could be consolidated if they are in fact owned by the uh, authority and there might be opportunities to cooperate with the downtown development authority at some point in the future of combining those with other sites and, and facilitating future investment in the downtown. So we're requesting about a thousand bucks. It's not a huge, huge cost to do this research, but I just wanted to uh, highlight it for your information. The other thing that we'll do is if we discover anything that would uh, require boards, the board's attention. We certainly give you the results of the analysis. We will definitely do that. But if there's anything that results from it that would require uh, a meeting, we could certainly call for that at the appropriate time later on this year. Yes, Council Member Ward. Sorry, another question somewhat related to this. Uh, given that the majority of the properties are purported to be city owned, why would the authority take up the cost of the title search rather than foisting that onto the city? Well, I, I don't think it's it's a huge expense, and I think we just want to confirm things. I think the, the city is probably thinking that those are city-owned land, so it's just a confirmation process to see if there's anything that's owned by the authority 
Uh, and that's why I think I was proposing that the authority would do the research just to confirm um, that the current ownership is valid either way. Okay, thank you. So if that makes sense, I don't know that there needs to necessarily be a motion on this to authorize it. I think we can um, do it as an administrative expense. I just wanted to raise this to you as an issue. And as I said, if we complete this, uh, we will definitely provide the results to you um, at the appropriate time. And if there's anything that the board needs to discuss relative to opportunities or moving forward or anything like that, we will certainly convene uh, a meeting to get that done at the appropriate time. So I think we could just do maybe some head nods and some that type of thing. Or if you have any final questions, um, be certainly glad to answer them. Or if you object to doing it, certainly take that direction as well. Brett, I just have a quick question. You may have already said this in the introduction and I just missed it. But so the, the, the property that, that brought this to light, the, the adjacent to the gas station across from the post office there, is that current in your search? Was that showing that it is indeed owned by the Englewood Urban Renewal Authority? Correct. The Arapaho County Assessor's records is what was relied on by other staff. I confirmed it myself, and it does list the ERA as the owner. Okay. Thank you. Um, is First Integrity Title um, just someone that we've the city has historically used in the past for these sorts of surveys, or was there a reason we went with them? Uh, Nancy, could you address that in terms of how we've worked with them? Yes, so I used them for my, um, or the city's home repair improvement program when uh, we have to do a, a lien on the property. And so I, I just do it through them. It's We've had them for probably 20 years that we've used. Doesn't mean we have to stay with them, but it's about $5 a, a search. For the O&E owner and encumbrance report. So, but at the authority's pleasure, we could look at others if you'd like. It's, seems pretty reasonable. Yeah. Thanks, Nancy. You're welcome. Are we good? All right. Thank you all. Appreciate that. Bernie, are you able to see your agenda again? I am. Okay, good. Uh, director's choice, is there anything uh, additional there? There we go. I, I do. So um, wanted to provide an update to you all about two items that are of importance in the central part of the, of the community. Uh, and that is our um, brand new uh, Englewood Downtown Development Authority. I want to talk a little bit about how that came to be and what the focus of their work is, and then talk a little bit about the status of the city center redevelopment. Next slide, please. So before I get into the specifics of the Downtown Development Authority itself, I would say that it's Downtown Development Authorities are somewhat alike and, and somewhat different um, than, Engle, than um, Urban Renewal Authorities. Uh, they are both chartered under a state statute, so they're really not emanating from the city's charter or the city's um, code. They're really derived from state enabling legislation, so that's a similarity. Um, the other similarity is, is they can invest very in very similar ways through the, the mechanism known as tax increment financing, and like urban renewal authorities, downtown development authorities can issue their own debt, um, however, with city council uh, authorization. The biggest way that they're different is urban renewal authorities uh, have retained the power of eminent domain over the years and downtown development authorities do not. So that's a little bit of comparison and contrast with how the, the two entities are alike and one big way they differ. But I did wanna talk about um, the Englewood Downtown Development Authority. So over the course of the last couple of years, uh, we have been doing some planning processing processes in the central part of the city we actually um, we're starting to develop a, a plan for the downtown. And we had a steering committee and, and did some various outreach to the constituencies in the downtown area. And the idea of forming a DDA uh, was, was proffered. And so we accelerated that discussion prior to the adoption of the downtown plan. And last uh, two summers ago, uh, in July of 2000, the city council authorized 
um, a formation election for the DDA. So this is another way that they're different. A, an urban renewal authority is formed by the city council by adopting an urban renewal plan. A downtown development authority gets to be voted on in terms of coming into existence by all the impacted property owners and residents within a proposed area. So council looked at that, um, settled on the boundaries in July of 2020. And in November that year, there was an election within the, the, the specific area um, of the proposed DDA, and that was passed, uh, where the voters authorized the DDA to be able to collect and spend revenues, including that property and, tax and um, sales tax increment. They did not at that time vote for authorizing long-term debt, and I'll address that in a moment. So uh, the, the authority was formed, and its spending capacity was was uh, enabled in November of 2020. And then the council authorized us or directed us to proceed with operationalizing the DDA in 2021 and also to provide some advanced funding um, to the DDA for uh, initial expenses. Next. So the downtown plan of development is really the DDA's master plan and kind of their guidance of what they should be doing. And I won't go through all the five major goals. This is all online if you're interested in seeing it. Um, but there, there are five major goals and strategies around the economy, marketing, public space enhancement, mobility and transportation, and downtown land uses and the design and character of downtown. And so the Downtown Matters consulting team and a steering committee put together the, the, uh, the plan. And it was unanimously adopted by council uh, in uh, last fall, in September of 2021. And as I said, that's really the, the, the five to 10 year master plan for the DDA and what they'll look to in terms of formulating their priorities. I should say that, that, mass, that the uh, downtown plan um, won the uh, best plan in downtown for 2021 from down, it won what's known as the Governor's Award from Downtown Colorado Inc. So we're very proud of the, that distinction that was drawn from uh, this area so early in its tenure. Next slide, please. So a few of the things that have happened this year, uh, the first budget for the DDA was adopted and approved in July of, the, of last year, 2021. There's also an intergovernmental agreement which specifies some a lot of administrative matters of how things would be handled between the city and the DDA that was also approved last July. And then the council approved a second ballot measure uh, in July of 2021 that asked the uh, voters of the district whether or not the DDA could be authorized to go into longer term debt over the course of the next 30 years. DDAs have a 30 year op window op of opportunity um, to um, do their work in terms of their initial authorization in Colorado. You may recall that urban renewal authorities have a 25 year um, time frame in terms of their implementation of plans. So that, that ballot measure was approved in July and the, and the voters uh, approved it in, uh, in November. Um, and as I mentioned, the downtown plan of development was um, unanimously approved by council in uh, September. Next slide, please. So the, the, the black dashed line is the outline of the DDA area. And where you see the purple, the orange and the green, those are three sub areas uh, within the DDA. When you think about this, this place, it's quite large and the development and investment opportunities are different depending on where you are in this area. And they may occur, they may occur at different times depending on where you are in this area. So um, the decision was made to create these three sub areas. The decision was further made to essentially start the urban renewal, not start the, um, the clock for long-term debt by servicing it through tax increment financing, property and sales tax at times where it was most advantageous. So we're actually working right now, we're gonna go, be going to council um, soon to talk about uh, these activ activizations of these investment areas, uh, the wellness district and South Broadway being the first two. And the reason why we wanna do that at the times where we think um, development is, is starting to happen is so that we don't burn that clock, so to speak, in areas that are not maybe quite teed up for redevelopment or investment, um, so that we're not diminishing that 30-year clock and, and maximize the investment opportunity that could be had in this area. Next slide. So this is a, a very high-level look and list of potential projects at this point 
that the uh, that the DDA could embark on and help facilitate over time. And the idea in a lot of these is these are public private partnerships. So um, the DDA would be bringing funding to the table and then you know the, the private sector, either through redevelopment or reconfiguration reconfiguration of existing properties, there's private investment as well. And if there is um, the ability to bond against future revenues, then the leverage that the urban north that the I keep saying, and I apologize that the downtown development authority has in this area is pretty significant to get to that $70 million number. Again, over the course of the next 30 years, uh, we don't know at this point if that dollar amount will be completely maxed out and don't have anything that's teed up right now in terms of a time for a debt issuance, but it's certainly um, a possibility as the downtown continues to uh, redevelop. There's obviously a lot of public investment that is prime in this area. Um, city center being one, I'll talk about city center, but also Broadway improvements, making the, the medical district more of a pedestrian um, experience than it is now. Even things like operating the trolley long-term and maybe changing that, 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 um, that service in different ways and expanding its capabilities. That's, that's the type of thing that the Downtown Development Authority um, can invest in. The other being things that are not maybe on the map, the, the softer um, side of things like uh, marketing or security and that type of thing. Those are all areas uh, where the DDA could have an influence and directly invest in outcomes. Next slide, please. So I can either take questions about the DDA now or um, we can wait and go through city center and take them all at once. It's, does anybody have a burning question about the DDA at this point? Did I confuse the heck out of everybody? No. <laughs> I hope not. So think of the questions if, uh, if they arise over this, uh, the next five minutes or so. Um, shifting a little bit, I uh, wanted to talk about city center. Obviously, that is um, the outline of city center, which I believe is 22 years old this year. Next slide. I think most, if not all of you, have seen this slide before. Council Member Ward, you've probably seen it more times than you probably care to admit because it's in every one of our slides um, that we'd share with the City Council. But the yellow outline is, of course, the city center boundary, um, which includes you know, the largest uses there, which is Walmart and the two big apartment buildings. Um, the blue area is everything that's owned by the city or the Anglewood Environmental Foundation. And then the red or orange, depending on um, your grading on your screen, that is the former wine garden property that's now owned by a real estate servicer in Florida that's trying to work with us to um, uh, resolve that and make that an investable uh, area again. Uh, so what we're trying to do is knit together a project that would enable us to redevelop everything um, or at least have a master plan and a development um, plan around everything in red and blue. So versus just doing the blue and leaving the red kind of to the market, we wanted to really try to capitalize on the opportunity that the foreclosure gave to the city uh, to really try to reconceptualize uh, the entire uh, big chunk of the city center area for its next generation. Next slide. So I think as, as we've probably covered before in early 2020, we um, came to an agreement with a firm known as Scanlon Kemper Bard or also SKB of Portland, Oregon. City Council um, selected them as the master developer, and we did what's known as a preliminary development agreement with, with them in the middle part of 2020. That essentially established a relationship between the entities in terms of cooperation and what each um, entity was going to give in terms of investment of time and that type of thing, and what the general scope of things that we would be looking at. It didn't reduce us to any kind of commitments on either side relative to obligations. Um, that was expen extended in April of 2021, and we're continuing to operate under the preliminary development agreement. It's obviously like everything else in our lives, uh, the pace of this project has been impacted by, by COVID in terms of the ability for us to come together and uh, for our SKB partners to um, make some decisions on some things in the absence of being able to really um, not be encumbered by some of the other impacts they had operating as a real estate company. Um, I will just refer back to the, the voter approval last November um, to authorize that long-term debt capacity 
um, by the, the Downtown Development Authority uh, was a pretty significant step for um, SKB's involvement because the, the redevelopment of city center is gonna take a pretty enormous investment in reconfiguring all of the public realm. So the parking garages, the streets, the uh, landscaping and everything that you can think about that would be in the public realm, a lot of that has to be reimagined and reconstructed. And so that comes with a cost. So there'll be various pools of money um, on the public side in terms of the public-private partnership that the council will decide ultimately in terms of the overall investment um, um, bucket. But one of those could be uh, a share or a portion of that um, downtown development authority debt authorization um, making its way to uh, facilitate the city centers, city centers redevelopment. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about the other player um, in this scenario, which is LNR Partners uh, from Miami, and those that is the group that is tasked with um, disposing of the the that red property, the foreclosed property on behalf of the bondholders or investors that foreclosed on Wine Garden. So they had a choice at the very beginning. And I think you know our redevelopment manager, Dan Perema, spent some time on this last year, as I recall. But they had a choice at the very beginning of just going out to the market and trying to see who would take it and try to re-tenant it for the next 52 years with retail tenants. Um, that really wasn't in the city's interest because we get no income. Uh, the city or EAF doesn't get any income from that, that part of the parcel. All of the investment or all the, the um, financial obligation in terms of um, the lease on the long-term lease on the ground for city center was all paid at once um, back in the day, back in um, the late 90s. So we also, as I said, wanted to merge it into that opportunity that we have at the city control portion of the area. So we actually spent several months going with uh, going through this rationale with LNR, uh, and they came around to that. They, I think they independently took a look at it and said, you know, this property is a lot is worth a lot more to our bondholders in, as a redevelopment opportunity versus just trying to fill um, the tenancy for the next 50 years with tenants that um, are harder and harder to find in the retail realm right now, um, especially ones that will pay a, a decent freight. So. Uh, that led us to discuss the idea of, of what we're calling a framework agreement, which has several key elements between uh, proposed elements. We haven't adopted this yet, but there's several elements between the city, EF, and LNR that would come together to um, facilitate their exit from the property and, and new investors coming in. The first is that we would terminate that ground lease and transfer the fee interest in the former wine garden property to buyers that would be able to develop. Um, at that point, it'd be very difficult to get um, a pretty comprehensive redevelopment and especially things like housing or a hotel or office, that type of thing on, a, on that diminishing ground lease. So placing the property in the private sector's hands was one of the assumptions um, that we were making relative to that element of the framework agreement. SKB is a potential buyer for that ground, but they're not necessarily a guaranteed um, buyer. We would obviously prefer that because that would that would give us um, um, one entity to deal with relative to the overall redevelopment than possibly several. Either way, we'll go forward. The other thing that was accomplished in 2021 is the city uh, council voted to rezone the city center parcel in its entirety from a planned unit development that was put in place obviously 20, 20, 22 years ago to what is known as mixed use business one or MUB one um, zoning, which is the main downtown zone district. So it's the city's most inclusive zone district. Um, it includes almost every use you can think of except for industrial. Uh, I'm kind of oversimplifying it, but if you think about that, so it would be a healthy mix of residential and commercial uses are allowed in MUB one. Curiously enough, hotels were not allowed. So we amended that to include hotels um, in MUB1, it was now um, allowed. But the old PUD, as it's known, was really a suburban scale development. Lots of surface parking lots, lots of huge big box buildings that are very hard to lease now. And unless, you know, it made no sense to try to amend that PUD because you'd basically have to start over. We also wanted to have city centers start to take on a little bit more of a connotation about being part of the downtown and not apart from it. 
And so having the zone district be unified with everything from the train to the east side of Broadway seemed to make a lot of sense. And, and that was one of the things that we completed um, over the summer. And then finally, um, LNR is interested in going to the market with, as you could probably imagine, um, the highest and best use on a lot of parcels right now in Englewood and throughout the Metro District, but especially near train, the, the light rail stations is additional residential development. And so we went to the council with the idea of not approving, but conceptual support for a 300 plus unit multifamily um, project on that, that, that key block, which is currently occupied by the former Office Depot site and the um, the current Harbor Freight site and that parking lot between the, the two of them. So that's kind of the elements of the framework um, pro, uh, process. We are still in negotiations with LNR to do that. In fact, we had a call with them yesterday. And again, what we're trying to do is trying to play matchmaker between LNR and SKB so that we can create um, outcomes that are favorable to, uh, to all of the parties. Yes, Council Member Ward, please. Just a couple of questions, Brad. Uh, uh, under the rezoning, that 350 unit multifamily prop project is now used by right in that area, correct? Yes. Okay. And then uh, secondarily, I'm a little confused by the termination of the ground lease aspect of this. So we have uh, the city owns the underlying ground. And then there is uh, this organization, LNR, that owns the rights to lease on top of that or build on top of that ground. Correct. So what would the city be giving up versus what LNR is giving up under that type of arrangement? So LNR would be um, essentially trying to um, get paid by private investors enough money to satisfy their creditors. So okay. they can pay off the creditors, LNR goes away, and okay. then we have a new development entity, SKB or others, that we would be dealing with. The thing, okay. that the, the thing that the city would do is, this is one of the things that we will we'll be talking to council about this soon, which is, this is essentially part of the city's contribution to the feasibility of the project, which is essentially enabling that land to be transferred to private development, which would generate, you know, not only uh, tax revenue, but just activity on the site um, that's really diminishing now. So that's that's the city's contribution to facilitating the redevelopment in the long term by placing the hands in the private sector versus doing another long-term ground lease, which limits the ability to attract certain types of uses that we want, especially as, as it relates to residential. A lot of the residential um, development pattern and, and the ways that residential is financed, it's, it's becoming increasingly difficult to do that on ground leases. So those are a couple of reasons why we would effectuate the transfer in that way. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a big give. Um, I'll just I'll say that outright. Like, Well, I understand that. And that's that's what council will give us ultimate direction on. We, we are very much aware of that. Thank you. OK. Next. So just to wrap up, um, one of the things that we are doing with um, SKB at the moment is we are um, having some discussions with them around an actual physical plan for the redevelopment of the site. And they've gone through probably 20 or 25 iterations of what could happen. And there's still a lot of balls in the air around that. Um, not the least of which, again, some of the things that, that the council will, will be required to weigh in and give specific direction on is the future of the building I'm sitting in. I'm sitting in the Civic Center building tonight. And there are pros and cons about whether or not that's, this building stays or it's reconfigured and what happens to the city, what kind of um, home would the city have in terms of replacement, how visible would it be, you know, what, what would be the, 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 the impact of doing that. Um, from SKB's perspective, um, the Civic Center building in terms of how it's configured is really inefficient in terms of taking maximal advantage of the train proximity and the redevelopment character of the entire site. It's, it's a, from their perspective, it's a complicating factor. Those are things we still you know, have to work through. The other big thing that we have to work through um, and start to invite is the community. Um, one of the things we were talking to SKB about you know, going forward is a community outreach process. 
that we're going out and, and getting the ideas from the community relative to uh, this very important site for the for the character of the community as it stands now, but also the long term opportunities um, that it represents. So we'll be designing that as well, um, sometime hopefully um, toward the spring and over the summer, likely. Hopefully, when we can all gather and feel good back together again in terms of um, being in person as well, that would help. It makes it a lot easier to do those. Um, all of that work is going to trend toward what we hope and expect um, if all of the parties can agree uh, for what's known as a master development agreement. And that would essentially serve as the roadmap for everything that would happen um, on this site in terms of the city's responsibilities, the developer responsibilities, what will be built when, obviously what will be built on certain, si on certain uh, parcels. Uh, it would specify all of the public investment that would be committed to the site. It would obviously specify the private obligations as well. So that would probably be a several hundred page document um, when it's ready to go. Uh, but that is essentially serves as um, the roadmap for the next generation plus, frankly, of, of, this, um, of this area in the community. Um, they tend to be uh, amended over time as, as things change, but they really serve as the fundamental building block um, for the entire scope of the project. And so we're, as I said, we're trying to negotiate uh, with LNR and SKB. Uh, we're playing ma matchmaker between the two of them in certain instances on certain parts of the real estate discussion so that each party can feel like that they're getting um, something that would be positive. Uh, obviously this, the Englewood's um, objective here is to have uh, a reconfigured city center and a redeveloped city center that stands the test of time, that, that spans multi-generations as a place in the community, as a destination Takes, takes more advantage of the proximity of the rail and is linked to the downtown and really serves as, as a key part of the central part um, of, of our community. Uh, the other thing that we've been doing, um, not independent, but as, as kind of an ancillary, not even ancillary, it's a very important part of it, is we've been in discussions with RTD about the long-term future of the parking um, here relative to RTD's parking specifically. Uh, RTD can utilize about 900 spaces between the parking garage adjacent to the Civic Center building and that north parking lot. And obviously over the course of the last two or so years, um, the idea of you know, how transit is happening has gone through a pretty huge metamorphosis in this community. And so RTD has been open to discussions around um, diminishing the parking pool here. Um, this area, I think Englewood is essentially subsidizing parking for people from other communities. Two thirds of the people who park here and take the train are not Englewood residents. And so we've, we've brought that up to the RTD staff. And I think they're, you know, they're very much aware of that. And we're also talking to them um, about what, our, what the reconfiguration redevelopment of city center could do in terms of providing more customers to RTD in the long-term relative to um, people living, more people living here in the city center area. Uh, that proximate to transit, I think RTD sees some value uh, there. RTD is very interested in if parking goes away, they're very interested in um, attainable and workforce housing kind of replacing it. And I think that's an evolving goal uh, across some of the policy decision makers uh, in the community as well. So we'll, we'll obviously be incorporating that in our discussions uh, with our development partner at SKB so that there's a variety of housing types um, on the city center site. Uh, in the future. Next and final slide, I will just wrap it up and be able to take any questions about um, either of the two topics that I covered. Yes, Bernie. I'm, I am assuming that Walmart owns their building and regardless of that fact, has there been discussion with them? Because, you know, for this, for this connectivity to be achieved, I think, you know, the, the, the civic center area, the, out, the area that was outlined is certainly vital, but I think that that Walmart piece is certainly a large part of this uh, this discussion. Right. That's a good question, a key point. Yes, Walmart does own their building and they own the land and the parking lot underneath it. And so one of the things that we will be doing with everyone, every entity that has an interest in the entirety of city center and through this redevelopment is we have to renegotiate and put in place new operating agreements in terms of how the whole area is managed um, it's maintenance and that type of thing. So Walmart will be a player in this outcome. And one of the things we want to talk to them about 
Um, obviously, they don't have any plans to reconfigure their store or, or you know, anything like that. But do we have the opportunity to work with them to maybe uh, think about the, the pedestrian realm and, and as it relates to how people connect from the western part of city center over toward downtown? And how do we get through that area now? It's very hazardous now. I think there's eight or nine curb cuts in their parking lot. Yeah. And it's I think it's... Um, it's not advantageous to circulation at this point. The other thing that I think we have an opportunity, um, maybe not immediately, but as I think the Western part of city center starts to redevelop, those two shopping centers that are east of Walmart are very much owned by real estate entities that are national in scope and probably not thinking about those being shopping centers for the next you know, 50 years. Uh, they see a lot of lot different investment value that's quickly emerging in that area. So I think the fact that um, Walmart would hopefully, and we expect them to be um, at the table and want to contribute positively to the outcome here, even if their store configuration doesn't change a lot, there might be ways that we work with them to ensure that they're part of the outcome, not just kind of sitting out, out there by itself. Don't you think if, if the, uh, I mean, my sense tells me that Walmart would probably maybe at some point come to the conclusion that maybe there's a development opportunity on their own land and that relocation might be beneficial for the, for both them and the viability of this area. I mean, is that something that has been discussed at all? No, I, I think Walmart sees that store as pretty stable and in a pretty key location relative to their overall market in the South Central part. Uh, of the Denver market. So we haven't heard anything from them in terms of they're looking at their ground values and seeing a different type of outcome. We haven't heard that yet. But again, I think what we need to do is to think about longer term here. I mean, this is not, I think city center was rather a small miracle in terms of how it was done 22 years ago. Oh, yeah. And that it, it essentially was completed and opened up pretty much all at once. And that's not going to be the case this time. This is going to be a phased project sure. and it's all going to be market driven. So I think if, you know, if, if the Western part of city center looks like something like this, that's not depicted on the screen in 10, 10 years or so. And those other two shopping centers to, on the East, they look something different. Yeah. Maybe so the folks in, in Arkansas take a different look at it, but I don't think that's on the immediate horizon in terms of a physical change there. We definitely want to make sure, as I said earlier, um, we want to make sure that the, the we can collaborate with one another as much as we can to make Walmart a part of the development rather than just, well, there's Walmart. Maybe easier than, than easier said than done, but that's part of the objective. Thanks. Okay, well, if there's nothing else, um, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back over to you for the rest of the meeting. There's just one other one other item. And I just, <laughs> where did it go? Um, it All right, I'll cheat. Say so if, if there's anything from any members of the, uh, the commission at this point, yeah, it's, it's an exactly. open forum for you all. Open forum, if there anybody has any comments, please do so now. Nobody. I'm going to make one comment on it's more of a statement than I guess it's sort of a question I think is already answered. But, you know, assuming that this title search comes back and the Urban Renewal Authority is not in any major ownership position on any of these parcels and based on the on the comments that you made opening this meeting uh, with the fact that we probably don't have any areas that would meet the blight criteria for a new development. I, I get the sense that this board is going to have another very quiet year of activity. And um, I'm just, you know, it, it, it's just, I'm wondering what else can be on our, um, if there's anything else that can creep into our uh, area of expertise here that could be activated at any point during this next year or two. Well, 
Well, I, I know you you said that that was going to be phrased as a statement, but if you allow me, yeah. um, I, I, I try to offer you um, one perspective or a couple of, of um, perspectives. One is, and I, I know that you all have heard me say this before, but um, in terms of formal activity, this project, <clears throat> this, this commission is driven by very specific criteria. And I mentioned that before, which is, you know, blight criteria that is very specifically enumerated in state law. And as your executive director, I just, in the market economy that we have now and the development opportunities that are essentially um, pacing themselves throughout the vast majority of this community, I don't see the necessity of that type of formal action um, by the board that is that blight-based and urban renewal plan-based. That being said, as I think as we continue to move forward on some of this central area um, redevelopment, uh, there might be opportunities to stay in a maintain, maintain a, uh, an advisory role. We could possibly do that informally, especially as it relates to city center. Um, I would um, hope that we could get as many community opinions around the city center as we can going forward. And that includes our boards and commissions and, and making sure that we um, have input from the transportation folks from the new sustainability board. And I think you all would be tailor-made to be part of that uh, in terms of offering your suggestions and advice relative to uh, what should happen in the future, the long, short and long-term future of city center. Uh, and I think the DDA may be amenable to um, hearing some perspective relative to this relatively new entity um, that's still finding their footing. They're less than a year old, um, but they'll be around for a while. And so I think there's opportunities to um, collaborate and engage in that area as well. So even if you're not doing a kind of a, a blight-based urban renewal plan, which would be your formal role, and that's, that's really your one formal role, mm -hmm. I'm going to be mindful and cognizant of opportunities to reach back out to you all um, as a board, not as individuals, but as a board, and have involvement in some of those key um, outreach efforts for some of the projects that we've described this evening, who I described this evening. So I know that may not get you all the way, Bernie, but um, hopefully. No, I mean that's 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 great to hear, and I, I, I'm just it, it's just more of kind of I think that question sort of comes up, and I think sometimes it's the silent, non-asked question in the room sometimes. But uh, right, um, I appreciate you elaborating on that. So. Does anybody else have any other? Comments, questions, or concerns before we wrap up? Then I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you. We can just do that by an A nay vote. All those in favor? Yes. Yes. Yeah. All those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you all for the time. It's very Thank much you. appreciated. Thanks, Brad. Good to see you all. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Care, it's everyone. great seeing you all. Well. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Take guys. Care. Good night.